So I want to start by uh, trying to make the case that stroke and HIV really represents the intersection of two large epidemics. Um, in the upper map here, we have HIV prevalence, and the lower map is stroke incidence. Um, and it's probably a little bit difficult for you to see the keys, but essentially in both maps, sort of the darker oranges, reds, and pinks represent higher prevalence uh, and similarly here, higher incidence. And you can see there's quite a bit of overlap between the two maps, um, particularly in low and middle income countries where rates of stroke are rapidly rising. Those are, of course, some of the same countries that have the highest burden of HIV. And in fact, in many of those countries, HIV and stroke are predicted to be two of the top three causes of mortality by the year 2030. I don't need to tell this audience that the patterns of morbidity and mortality in HIV are changing uh, with the risk of death after a non-AIDS related event, meaning heart disease, stroke, renal disease, being significantly higher than the risk of death after an AIDS related event, such as opportunistic infection and AIDS related malignancy. And of course, our HIV-infected patients are aging, which is precisely the reason why we're here today. This is a map from UNAIDS um, from 2012 showing the proportion of adults that are 50 years of age and older um, by different regions of the world, ranging from about 33% in 2012 in the US and Europe to approaching 20% in South America and Central America, and even about 10% in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in the United States, of course, we use this um, magical number of sort of 50% by essentially now, and we're definitely there. And in some parts of the United States, including in San Francisco, where I see patients, we are beyond that. And in fact, in San Francisco, the year 2014, we had about 58% of our patients who were 50 years of age and older. And uh, unfortunately for all of us, with older age, you essentially have more age-related comorbidities, both in the general population and also in HIV-infected patients. These are data from the Swiss HIV cohort study, essentially just showing <coughs> that uh, the older you are, the greater your risk of stroke. So if you are 50 years of age and older, or if you are 65 years of age and older, your risk of stroke compared to your younger counterparts is higher, about four times higher if you're 50 and up, and about 18 times higher if you're 65 years of age and older. So the question, of course, is, is this simply the intersection of these two epidemics, and we are bound to, of course, see some of our HIV-infected patients develop stroke, or is there really more to the story? Is HIV itself a risk factor for stroke? Are the proposed mechanisms of stroke different in HIV-infected individuals compared to the general population? Are there certain populations with HIV who may be at particular risk? And then, in addition to that, is it really just about stroke? Or are there also stroke-related health outcomes, including, importantly for our patients, cognitive impairment, which may also be impacted due to this increased cerebrovascular risk? So yes, absolutely, HIV is itself a risk factor for stroke. Um, and we know from several large cohort studies that rates of stroke in people living with HIV are higher than in uninfected um, individuals who are matched um, by age. Uh, these are data from the Danish uh, HIV cohort study. And essentially, they found that in their HIV-infected population that there was about a 60% greater risk of all types of cerebrovascular events compared to uninfected controls. We have looked in the partners cohort, which is um, a cohort in Boston, and we have separated out ischemic stroke from hemorrhagic stroke because they do have different pathophysiologies, and we have found similar results. So first we looked at ischemic stroke in this population and found that there was about a 20% higher risk of ischemic stroke in our HIV-infected cohort compared to controls, and that was after taking into account traditional vascular risk factors, demographics, smoking. And then in addition to that, when we looked at intracerebral hemorrhage or hemorrhagic stroke, we saw a similar effect of HIV with about a twofold greater risk of HIV-infected individuals compared to uninfected controls. So the question, of course, is, 
if it's not just due to higher traditional vascular risk, what is it due to in terms of why patients with HIV are at increased risk of stroke? Um, and I, I think that that question is very much still being answered. Um, I think generally we think that it's probably a multifactorial process, that absolutely higher traditional vascular risk contributes to higher stroke risk in HIV, but likely other things contribute as well, including, of course, antiretroviral therapy, which I'll speak briefly about. Um, and in addition to that, immunodeficiency, viremia, and associated inflammation, immune activation, and of course, endothelial dysfunction. Um, so the story in terms of cardiovascular risk and ART exposure I think is quite complicated and has been really difficult to sort of tease apart what is due to ART, what is due to HIV, and what is due to other things. Um, and this story is the same in terms of stroke risk specifically. Uh, these are data from the DAD study that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and essentially they found um, looking at a composite outcome of cardiovascular events of which stroke was one, that there was an increased risk of cardiovascular events for every additional year of ART exposure. And they were uh, finding that there was about a 26% uh, increase in risk for each year of exposure. However, after additional follow-up, when they accrued more stroke events and they pulled out the stroke separately, they actually did not find any association between ART exposure and specifically stroke risk. And I think that in some cohorts we have seen an association and others we have not. And that includes abacavir, that includes some of the specific protease inhibitors. So I, I don't think there necessarily is a clear um, sort of conclusion from some of these studies. We have tried to use cerebrovascular endothelial function as one way to get at how different HIV-related risk factors impact stroke risk. Um, and we have most recently done this in a cohort in China, actually, 75 individuals with HIV in China, all on ART, all virologically suppressed. Um, the majority of them are on a regimen of lamivudine and tenofovir or AZT, and either efavirenz, nevirapine, or lopinavir, ritonavir. Um, because they're in China, the government pays for their ARTs. It's actually fairly limited in terms of what ARTs they've been exposed to. And for all of them, lopinavir, ritonavir is the only PI that they've seen. And for many of them, they've only been on one or two regimens. Um, and we measured cerebrovasoreactivity, which is a marker of cerebrovascular endothelial function that's associated with large artery strokes, but is probably more a marker of small vessel disease. Um, and we uh, measured uh, cerebrovasoreactivity using transcranial Doppler and a very simple breath holding test. So you can see here the TCD or transcranial Doppler apparatus that they have on. Um, and essentially at baseline, we measure their flow velocities in the middle cerebral arteries, so just using ultrasound probes placed right at the temples, essentially. Um, and, it, and we have them hold their breath for 30 seconds. And in that 30-second period, their CO2 rises, so they become hypercapnic. And as a result, there's an increase in flow velocities due to vasodilatation of the arterioles. And then we have them hyperventilate, blow off their CO2, CO2, and there is resulting vasoconstriction and a reduction in flow velocity. So it's actually a very simple test, and the expected, the expected result is, again, a rise in flow velocities with hypercapnia and a reduction in flow velocities with hypocapnia. And what we found was that, indeed, the group that was on lopinavir, ritonavir, had worse cerebrovascular endothelial function compared with the reference group, which was individuals on efavirenz, and that this was independent of vascular risk factors, independent of their duration of ART use, and also independent of how long they had been diagnosed with HIV. Um, and granted, you know, lopinavir, ritonavir is obviously not a regimen that's used in the U.S. and in other um, high-income countries. Certainly still remains an uh, agent that is used in low- and middle-income countries. Um, and in addition to that, I think it raises the question of whether this is an effect that is restricted to some of the older PIs, or, you know, is it possible that we could see a similar effect in some of the newer PIs? Obviously, these are questions that, you know, we don't know the answers to.
um, because cerebrovascular endothelial function measured with TCD is really more a marker of small vessel disease, it didn't surprise us that there have been other pathology studies that have shown an association between PI use and cerebral small vessel disease. So this is a study um, uh, that was actually an autopsy study, and they looked at autopsy at cerebral vessels um, within uh, patients with HIV, looking either for uh, normal vessels or mild small vessel disease or moderate to severe cerebral small vessel disease. And they found in their cases, 130 cases, um, that a quarter had mild small vessel disease and almost half had moderate to severe small vessel disease. One thing, though, that I will point out is that of these 137 cases, less than half were on ART at the time of their death. And I think that's important to point out because obviously this population is very different than the population that we studied in in China where everyone was treated and everyone was virologically suppressed. Nevertheless, they found in their analysis that exposure to PIs at the time of death um, was associated with small vessel disease, whereas other non-PI based regimens were not. And in addition to that, small vessel disease at the time of autopsy was also associated with cognitive impairment, and we'll talk more about that association later on in the talk. In some of the studies, we've also found that the longer you're on ARVs, in fact, that might be protective against stroke. And we found that in our partner's cohort study. Um, and I think, generally speaking, we, we think that that's probably because longer ARV duration is a proxy for um, less immunodeficiency. And I think the one consistent finding across all of the big epi studies of stroke has been that if your CD4 count is low, or if you have a detectable viral load, those are some of the strongest risk factors for stroke in HIV populations, including in these various uh, studies that I've listed here. Um, and most recently, in the ALERT cohort, um, which is about 7,000 HIV-infected patients that we studied from a variety of ACTG clinical trials, we looked at both traditional vascular risk factors and then we looked at some of these HIV-specific risk factors and again found that of the traditional risk factors, for example, aging by 10 years was associated with a twofold greater risk of stroke. And you can look at that in comparison to having a detectable viral load, which was associated with a threefold greater risk of stroke, or approximately 15 years of sort of older age. So sort of to give you a flavor of, again, the traditional vascular risk factors such as aging and then other HIV-related risk factors. Um, and then lastly, um, as, as many of you in the room also know, even in patients who are on treatment, who have undetectable viral loads, and who have good CD4 counts, we still think that those patients are likely at higher cardiovascular and cerebrovascular risk, and we have some uh, data supporting that. These uh, are data from Steve Grinspoon's group at MGH um, in collaboration with Ahmed Tawakal, who's a, a cardiologist. He's a cardiology um, imaging person. And essentially, they used FDG PET to look at inflammation in the aorta wall. Uh, and what they found was even in their cohort, again, of HIV-infected patients all on treatment, virally suppressed, that they had more inflammation in the aorta wall, uh, which is a robust cardiovascular risk marker compared with uninfected individuals that were matched not just for age, but also matched in terms of their vascular risk factors. And in addition to that, the presence of aortic wall inflammation was associated with systemic markers of inflammation as well as systemic markers of monocyte activation. And I think the question, of course, is in addition to the therapies that we have as far as um, treating HIV, and in terms of aggressively treating traditional vascular risk factors, is there any role for an adjunctive treatment in terms of anti-inflammatory agents that may further help to reduce cardiovascular risk? And there are a couple of studies that are either uh, ongoing or recently completed looking at things like methotrexate and kenikinumab to see, again, whether these anti-inflammatory agents can also reduce cardiovascular risk in HIV. And there's one study at UCSF right now with kenikinumab, and we have added on a variety of both neurological and neurovascular outcomes to see whether or not they can also reduce cerebral vascular risk. So hopefully more, more to come on that specific issue. I want to switch gears and speak a little bit about the impact of aging and sex on stroke risk in HIV. 
Um, as I have said already, I think um, without a doubt, unfortunately again, the older we get, the more at risk we are for stroke. Um, this is back to the alert cohort showing again uh, very clearly that rates of stroke rise with increasing age, so not, not surprising. Um, but I think one thing that may potentially vary is how much HIV may contribute to stroke risk um, in terms of age. So this was a study that was published just earlier this year from Malawi, one of the uh, few, although there are more now studies published about stroke and HIV from a, a low middle income country. Um, and essentially they did a case control study. Uh, so they had cases of stroke and then cases of non-stroke, or I'm sorry, controls that were non-stroke. Um, median age in the two groups was six and 57, and the HIV prevalence in the stroke cases was 31%, and in the uh, controls, so the non-stroke controls, was 19%. Um, and they found that HIV was a risk factor for stroke, and they also found, of course, that traditional vascular risk factors were also um, risk factors for stroke. Uh, but what was interesting was they also split their stroke cases into a younger group and an older group. So the younger group is here on top and the older group here on the bottom. And what they found was that in the younger group, there's this delay, that in the younger group, the PAF, or the population attributable fraction of risk of stroke due to HIV was 42% compared with the population attributable fraction of risk due to hypertension was 11%. And you can contrast that with the older group in which it was really flipped. So in the older group, the proportion of stroke risk that was attributed to HIV was only 6%, whereas the proportion of stroke risk due to hypertension was much higher. And we've seen a similar pattern in the partners cohort as well, in which essentially at younger age groups, it looks like potentially HIV may have more of, a, of a, an effect, whereas with older age, that effect seems to be somewhat lower. So for example, if you are 20 years of age and you are a man with HIV, the associated hazard of hemorrhage in this case is about four, and you can compare that with a slightly older age group of 40 years in which the hazard ratio for HIV for men is about two. So again, as you go down, the hazard ratios are getting smaller, and then in the older age groups, they are not significant, though of course those are much smaller sort of groups of people in some of the older uh, age groups. And similarly, same effect in women. The reason why these are split in two is because there's actually an interaction um, between sex uh, and the outcome. Um, but sa same thing sort of on both sides. And we've also found that some of the traditional vascular risk factors seem to modify the impact of HIV on stroke risk. So this is actually going back to our China study in which we found that essentially if you have a lower, more normal cholesterol level, that HIV has a negative impact on your stroke risk or your vasoreactivity, and HIV is the dotted line here, whereas at the higher cholesterol levels, there is actually no statistical significance between the HIV group and the HIV uninfected group. And not surprisingly, the folks with the lower cholesterol levels are our younger patients, and the folks with the higher cholesterol levels are our older patients, suggesting that perhaps with older age, as you develop more traditional vascular risk factors, that it's possible that their impact on stroke risk may overshadow the impact of, of HIV itself. We'll switch gears. I'll say a few things about um, uh, women uh, and stroke risk. Um, so I, I showed this slide earlier of our partner's uh, cohort telling you that there was about a 20% increased risk of stroke uh, in the entire cohort. Uh, but when we split it up by women and men, it really looked like it was among women that we were seeing the greatest impact of HIV, whereas in men, the stroke rates among those with HIV and without were pretty similar and there was actually not a statistically significant difference between the two. So again, it really seemed like this effect was being driven primarily by women. And when we broke that down by age group, you can see again, stroke rates increase with older age, but it was mostly in some of the younger age group where we were again seeing most of the impact of HIV. And the instance rate ratio, for example, for the youngest age group was 
much higher than for some of the older age groups. However, I think that you do have to interpret this with caution in the sense that these younger age group individuals, of course, have lower baseline risk. So you could have a relatively small increase in their absolute rate of stroke, and that could result in a large relative increase in their stroke risk. So we also looked at the um, absolute rate differences in each of the group. And you can see it's actually fairly stable across all age groups and overall, in which there is about two events additional for HIV-infected women compared to women without HIV. So of course, questions remain in terms of what could potentially be driving, at least in this case, the relative increase in stroke risk for women. And I think the hypothesis that potentially more inflammation and more immune activation in women with HIV may explain some of this difference in stroke risk. Um, and you can see in this study from Steve Grinspoon's group that women with HIV had higher monocyte activation, not just than women without HIV, but also compared to men with HIV. And these findings in terms of higher monocyte activation also correlated with cardiovascular risk, and they used a non-calcified coronary plaque burden as their marker of calcified risk. And that, again, raises whether it's possible that differences in monocyte activation may be explaining some of the differences in cardiovascular and also in stroke risk that, that have been seen. So that was all regarding sort of relative differences in risk. Again, coming back to the alert cohort from the ACTG, we were surprised to find not a relative difference in stroke risk, but rather we actually saw that the absolute rates of stroke in women with HIV were higher than in men with HIV. And when we broke that down by age group, it was actually mostly in this, oops, mostly in this 40 to 49 year old age group where we were seeing the biggest difference. Interpret this with caution as well, because these are very small numbers in each of these age groups. But still, there's a signal that potentially in this age group, um, there may be more of a difference. And that, of course, raises the question of menopause, right? And, and that is something that, unfortunately, in the alert cohort, we haven't been able to look at. But certainly, there is the suggestion from some other studies that potentially, not just menopause, but sort of that transition from premenopause, peri, postmenopause, that during that time, women may be, for some reason, at higher risk. Um, and again, from Sarah Luby and Mark Zani at MGH, they have looked at this using uh, anti-malarian hormone as a marker of ovarian reserve. And what they found in a pretty small study, about 50 HIV-infected women, 25 uninfected women, that reduced ovarian reserve in the HIV group seemed to contribute more to cardiovascular risk than their traditional vascular risk factors, whereas in the uninfected group, it was very much their vascular risk that played a role and less so their ovarian reserve. So again, raising the question of, is there possibly an interaction between the effect of menopause or sort of that transition on stroke risk and, and HIV? Okay, so in the remaining uh, minutes, I'm going to uh, switch gears one last time and talk a little bit about um, cognitive impairment and its relationship with cerebrovascular disease um, and whether or not it's a vascular phenomenon. Um, and this is something that has received definitely increasing interest recently. Um, I actually had on here a, an editorial that Bruce Brew had written, but I took it off because I thought the slide looked cleaner. But knowing that Bruce is here, I wish I had kept it on. So there's been a lot of interest uh, regarding this topic. Um, so we have known for quite some time, actually, that vascular risk is associated with cognitive impairment, both in the general population and also in, in people living with HIV. Um, over 10 years ago, Victor Valcor, at that time in Hawaii, published a study showing that uh, diabetes and insulin resistance were both associated with HIV-associated dementia and cognitive impairment. And then in the sub-study of SMART, neurology sub-study of SMART, one of the strongest risk factors for cognitive impairment in that study was pre-existing cardiovascular disease. And in fact, in some studies, there's a suggestion that vascular risk in our HIV-infected patients may play much, much more of a role than HIV status itself. And this is a study from Jim Becker from the MAX, essentially showing us that carotid intima media thickness and coronary artery calcium, both, again, cardiovascular risk markers, were associated with worse cognitive uh, impairment but HIV status itself 
in this particular cohort was not. So again, getting to that question of is it possible with older age that vascular risk really plays much more of a role than HIV itself? And there's also compelling evidence uh, from studies looking at structural markers of cerebral um, ischemic disease, and in this case of cerebral small vessel disease. So we use um, white matter hyperintensities as one radiologic marker of cerebral small vessel disease, in addition to lacunar strokes and cerebral microbleeds. Um, and uh, white matter hyperintensities are associated both with an increased risk of stroke, but also with an increased risk of cognitive impairment. And we are, in the general population, understanding more and more about sort of um, the spectrum of Alzheimer's, dementia, vascular dementia, and how much probably overlap there really is between those two different entities. So in HIV cohorts, Victor Valcor, a couple of years ago now, presented this data, um, and I believe it's under review, in which essentially they found that having HIV was absolutely associated with a higher number of cerebral white matter hyperintensities, um, as well as sort of total white matter hyperintensity volume. They did not find that any HIV-related risk factors were associated with white matter hyperintensities, but it looked like smoking and hypertension both had more of an effect on white matter hyperintensities in the HIV group compared to the HIV uninfected group. And in addition to that, the more white matter hyperintensities you had, the worse your cognitive function in his cohort. And more recently, what Bruce wrote um, his editorial to, this was just published in AIDS uh, not too long ago. Uh, this is from uh, the age HIV cohort in the Netherlands. And they also looked at the same marker, so periventricular white matter hyperintensities, a marker of small vessel disease. They looked at lacunar strokes, also small vessel disease, um, and then also deep white matter hyperintensities. And you can see, actually, how interesting, the median HIV-infected white matter hyperintensity burden is just this here. So you can see in red what we're talking about. So you know, not a huge amount, but still present. And you can compare that to the HIV uninfected group here, um, where you can see sort of less red in these periventricular areas. And what they found essentially was in their group of HIV infected individuals, all treated, that they essentially um, had more white matter hyperintensities, just like Victor found, compared to the uninfected group, and that the older you were, not surprisingly, the more your white matter hyperintensity burden. But what was really interesting was that the association between HIV and worse cognitive impairment was attenuated when they included white matter hyperintensities into the model suggesting that white matter hyperintensities might be mediating, of course, that relationship between HIV and cognitive impairment. And then lastly, I do want to say just one other thing. So in that last study, they didn't see any interaction between HIV and age. But in other studies, there has been a suggestion that perhaps there is an interaction between the two. And this is one of those studies. This study didn't look at white matter hyperintensities, but rather looked at DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, which is more of a sort of microscopic look at the white matter in the brain. And the idea is that you might see DTI changes before you even see white matter changes. Changes. And as you can see, in a couple of different places where they looked, there was absolutely an interaction between HIV and age. For example, in the corona radiata, the, uh, inter or, I'm sorry, the relationship between age and white matter injury was much steeper in the HIV group shown in blue. And then in a couple other areas, there was in fact no relationship between age and white matter injury in the uninfected group, whereas there was in the HIV infected group. Okay, so with that, I don't know what time it is. I will stop, um, and I, I will leave up um, this slide, but I do want to acknowledge uh, mentors and collaborators from many different institutions um, in terms of their help with work presented here um, and with other ongoing work as well. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. <laughs> I've been told that I can, I'm allowed to do this slide. So this is just the summary slide in which basically, you know, the idea is um, that we definitely know that the risk of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke is elevated in people living with HIV and that certainly traditional vascular risk plays a large role, but it doesn't fully explain that increased risk in people with HIV. We do think that probably there are some antiretroviral therapies that increase stroke risk and that may be through, again, impaired 
impaired cerebrovascular endothelial function. The impact of HIV probably is different depending on the age of the person. Um, and then lastly, I think there is compelling evidence that at least some portion of the pathophysiology of cognitive impairment in HIV um, is related to probably vascular phenomenon and specifically probably uh, cerebral small vessel disease. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>